Coming up next on the Connecticut Network. In key wartime elections from the Civil War to Iraq, the nation's eyes were turned toward our state. I'm Diane Smith. Join me at Connecticut's Old State House for When Connecticut's Vote Mattered, the latest installment in a series titled Taking Sides, the Role of Partisanship in Politics and Policy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Connecticut's Old State House for this first in a series of lectures for this season, lectures and panel discussions called Taking Sides, the Role of Partisanship in Policy and Politics. We have an exciting series planned and lots of great people in here for discussion. And for this, I would like to thank the Connecticut Humanities Council, who has supported this program through generous funding. I would also like to thank Diane Smith for moderating our discussions today. I'll thank our speakers and panelists in advance. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today. I know that we're going to learn a lot in the next hour, and we're going to hear a lot of interesting ideas and opinions and information. And um, our hope is that you will take what you hear in this program home with you and start a conversation with somebody about it, um, relaying some of the information that you've learned today, injecting some of your own ideas, and getting feedback from people about what they think about what we hear today. We believe that good conversation lies at the heart of a good democracy. And so the Old State House is really trying to embark on programs that bring conversation alive for us. This building served as the seat of Connecticut government for decades, and it was filled with debates and discussions and arguments and all kinds of um, different ideas being thrown around. And in fact, um, some people who say that the old state house is haunted will often say that the hauntings they hear are people debating in the chambers upstairs. So it's a place that's been lively for a long time with, with debate. We want to bring that back to the old state house through these panel discussions and talks, but we also want to extend that idea a little further in the future. So today you're going to be getting surveys asking you what you thought of the program, but also asking you if you would be interested in the future um, after a panel discussion to stay around a little bit longer or come back on another day for a conversation with other audience members in small groups to really poke at some of the ideas that we hear and talk about them, explore them, to share your opinions and to hear what other people have to say about them. If that's an idea that interests you, we hope you'll indicate that on your survey. And if you'd like to talk to us about that, please be sure to do so after the program today. Um, in the meantime, I would like to um, invite you to enjoy this afternoon's program. We will be um, hosted by Diane Smith, who has done a wonderful job with our previous programs. You know her probably, as you've seen her on TV. She's, very, um, she's written many books on Connecticut, and uh, when you think of Positively Connecticut, you usually think of Diane Smith. She's a wonderful um, ambassador for Connecticut, and we're very pleased to have her helping us with these programs. Diane, welcome. Thank you. I just wanted to explain uh, the format of what we're going to be doing. Dr. Matt Warshower will be speaking first, and uh, then we'll take a momentary break while our panel comes up onto the stage and we resume the conversation. And I'm going to have some questions for them and we're going to look to you if you would also like to participate. We'll be happy to have you as part of that. Um, I'd also like to tell you that um, if you want to share this event with other people or if you just want to uh, find something fun to do on Saturday night, you can pull out the popcorn maker and you can watch this on CTN. It will be airing on the Connecticut Network uh, probably on Saturday night uh, in the evening and then several times after that and you can check the ctn.com website to find out exactly when it will be airing. So it's my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker for our talk on a topic that we're calling When Connecticut's Vote Mattered. We're going to take you to a period when Connecticut's support for the war was watched by the nation 
And in this case, I'm talking about the Civil War. Later in the program, we'll discuss another time when war was the issue and when the nation looked toward Connecticut to see how Connecticut would respond. So Dr. Matt Washauer received his BA in history from Central Connecticut State University in 1990. He completed his master and doctoral degrees at St. Louis University in American Studies. Dr. Warshower then joined the faculty at CCSU in 1997, and two years ago he won the Connecticut State University Trustees Research Award. He has served as the editor of Connecticut History since 2004, and as, in addition to teaching classes in American political and constitutional history, he serves as the chair and the project coordinator for Connecticut Commemorates the Civil War. His next book is going to be released in 2011 by Wesleyan University Press, and it's entitled Civil War Connecticut from Slavery to Commemoration. I'd like to join, have Dr. Warshower join us now. Thank you very much. It's always uh, a pleasure to come back to the old State House and speak here. Uh, this is an extremely historic building. It's been at the center of Connecticut society and Connecticut history for a long, long time. And so whenever I get an opportunity to talk here, I always jump at it. So what I want to talk to you today about is, you know, we, we talk about when Connecticut's vote mattered. And in the Civil War period, it mattered a whole lot especially our gubernatorial elections. And I want to kind of set the context a little bit before I go into those elections. I'm going to be speaking about two very specific elections, 1860 and 1863. At this time, our governors had to be reelected every single year, not every few years. That would be fun, huh, Tom? Uh, trying to deal with that. But uh, just to give you a little bit of the context of what's going on during this time period, uh, the, the United States today is in its third evolution of a party system uh, of Republicans and Democrats. That evolution, that party system, begins just prior to the American Civil War. In the 1850s, there is a gigantic shakeup, a disintegration of the parties. The Democratic Party almost fails completely, and the Whig Party goes out of existence. And from the ashes of all of that, there is a competition to create new parties. One of those new parties is the Republican Party. And if we know anything about politics today, we know that political parties and politicians, they, it, they don't just evolve and come about of their own will. It has to be worked on, and there has to be excessive campaigning and politicking, and uh, they need to work out the details of all this party structure. And so our first Connecticut governor, come, our first Republican governor, excuse me, comes to power in 1858. This is William Buckingham. Now, Buckingham was you know, originally from Norwich, Connecticut. He had been a mayor there. He had been a businessman there. Uh, he was fairly well known in the Norwich area. He comes to power in this new Republican Party. And, you know, we know at this point that sectionalism in the United States, you know, divisions between the North and South are growing more and more extreme throughout the 1850s. And uh, there's uh, an extreme amount of tension that's going on at this time period. And Republicans are trying to build their support of their party throughout the North and, and in New England. Uh, there are no Republican parties in the South. The Republican Party is principally a Northern party, or often described as an anti-Southern party. And it's, it's kind of key to call it an anti-Southern party as opposed to an anti-slavery party. There really is a big difference between the two. And the history of slavery and, and race in Connecticut is an extremely interesting story as well, a little bit different from what we're going to talk about today. But it, it fits within the larger issues here. So Buckingham, as I said, has to run every single year. And he serves from 1858 all the way through the war, through 1866, and then steps down. And I imagine at that point he was actually pretty tired. Uh, the, we, we have a tendency to think that the North and New England, Connecticut, was solidly Republican, solidly anti-slavery, the, we were solidly for the Union, and this is simply a myth. Connecticut was a, a battleground state. It was heavily contested. One of the reasons that the nation looked to Connecticut as kind of a, a, a bellwether for the rest of the nation is that we're used to our political elections occurring in November. 
At this time period, they occurred in the first Monday in April. So Connecticut was way ahead of the curve. The only other states were, that were right around the same time period we were were New Hampshire and Rhode Island. The rest of the nation followed us in about a 15-month spread. And so they would, it, it's very similar to presidential primaries today. When you know, we're getting close to presidential elections and nominations, everybody looks to New Hampshire first for that early primary. Connecticut worked exactly the same way during the Civil War period, and, and, and earlier than that, actually. So Buckingham is running, and the, the Republican Party views control of the governorship in Connecticut as extremely important as kind of a message of what might happen in the 1860 election. In 1856, the Republicans had managed to, to run John Fremont, their very first presidential candidate. He had come close to, I mean, he had garnered a lot of votes. He didn't win, but the Republicans really kept their eye out for 1860, and they learned a tremendous amount about the 1856, or from the 1856 election. And so they were really preparing for 1860 and keeping an eye on what was going on and trying to build as much support throughout the North to win this 1860 election. And so the Republicans, you know, they really had their eye on Connecticut to see if Buckingham can retain control of the governorship, that will give us an indication of how the Republicans might do throughout the rest of the North. Now, at this point, even coming into the April 1860 election, uh, Abraham Lincoln is not the Republican nominee yet. The Republicans are still out there kind of fishing around and looking for who might be the most electable candidate. And so Buckingham, at this point, is running against Thomas H. Seymour. And I have some basic facts here. He, he's a major in the Mexican-American War. Uh, he late leads the charge at Chapultepec. He earns a promotion to colonel for heroism. He's extremely popular in Connecticut. Uh, he's elected governor from 18, each year from 1850 to 1853. He's then appointed uh, the minister to Russia from 1853 to 57. He returns home to Connecticut after that. And as I said, he's a very, very popular man. The Democrats decide, we want to get rid of this guy Buckingham and kill this Republican uh, you know, movement in Connecticut. We'll run Seymour. He's the guy who can get rid of Buckingham. And so they run Seymour. The Republicans look at this candidate, as, or this, this election rather, as so important that they decide to bring Lincoln into Connecticut. He had been traveling in New York. This is the time period where he does his famous Cooper Union address, which is the, the thing that really kind of separates him from the other potential Republican nominees and makes the Republican Party look at Lincoln and say, this is the guy who could win this whole thing in 1860. He is traveling in New York. He's also traveling in uh, New Hampshire where he's visiting his son. And things are so close in Connecticut that the Republican state uh, party you know, heads decide, we got to get this guy Lincoln to come to Connecticut and campaign on behalf of William Buckingham. And so they bring him here. He gets a letter, you know, from James Brigg. It says, you have a special call there and a duty to perform. And I had to make sure in preparing this, this uh, PowerPoint, I had to make sure I had Lincoln with no beard because, you know, that's post, po that's post President Lincoln. So Lincoln comes to Connecticut. He travels throughout the state. He lectures or, or delivers addresses in five different cities throughout the state. There are uh, large gatherings. Uh, they, the Republicans in the state greet him with open arms. They are excited that he's here. Lincoln has a reputation for being uh, a very down-to-earth speaker who has an ability to, to connect with his audiences. His primary theme at the time is the problem of slavery. That should be no great surprise. What we often forget, however, is that Lincoln as a candidate, Lincoln early as a president, he was not an abolitionist. He was not committed to the complete eradication of slavery. He believed that slavery was wrong, but he also believed that it was constitutionally protected. And so what his goal was, and he lectured about this in Connecticut, we have copies of his speeches, he said to the people, we need to make a deal like our fathers did, those who founded the Union, and control slavery and have it exist only where it currently exists, but stop its spread in the West. So the Republican Party was not so much an abolitionist party as, it, as much as they wanted to stop the expansion of slavery into the West. 
So Lincoln comes here, he lectures all over the place in these five cities, and he has something of a mesmerizing effect. Now imagine what might have happened if Lincoln hadn't come and hadn't kind of whipped up popularity for Buckingham. Now Buckingham's already popular to some extent, but having Lincoln come makes a big difference for Buckingham's candidacy. Now, you might have heard of the Wide Awakes. This is uh, an image of a procession, as you can see, of the Wide Awake Club on Main Street in Hartford. The Wide Awakes were kind of a semi-military type organization of, of young men who donned overcoats and caps and held these uh, torch-lit lamps and marched down the street in unison and campaigned on behalf of Lincoln. And the Wide Awake organization, it's almost like, almost like a political fraternity, becomes extremely popular throughout the rest of the country, and it's founded right here in Hartford. Uh, one of the really remarkable things about Connecticut's Civil War history is that we have a wide, wide variety of firsts in regards to the history of the Civil War, from the first officer to be killed in battle, the first general to be killed in battle. Uh, it's not all about death. Uh, we have the first Soldiers' Aid Society that is created in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We end up creating the first Soldiers' Home, which is a, a forerunner to the modern veterans' uh, home uh, system in the country. So, I mean, there's a lot of firsts when it comes to Connecticut. Lincoln, after his visit here, writes to Connecticut's senator, Lyman Trumbull, and says, they are having a desperate struggle in Connecticut, and it would both please and help our friends there if you could be with them in the last days of the fight. Having been there, I know they are proud of you as a son of their own soil, and would be moved to greater exertion by your presence among them. Can you not go? Telegraph them now and go right along. The fiendish attempt now being made upon Connecticut must not be allowed to succeed. And Trumbull does exactly what Lincoln asks. He immediately returns home to Connecticut and begins campaigning on behalf of Lincoln. And this is about 10 days before the election. So then they're really putting things in high gear. Ultimately, Buckingham is victorious. 541 votes is the spread. So it gives you an idea of how close this election actually is. And then you can see the specific uh, uh, turnout, the, the, what the actual votes are for each candidate. And it's extremely uh, close. And when you have close elections like that, you generally have bigger voter turnout. And you can see that there was an increase of 10,000 votes. That's a lot when you're talking about a 541 spread. James Bab Babcock of New Haven writes to Lincoln immediately after the election and states, the Republicans have come out of their terrible conflict safely. And then he adds that Lincoln's speeches were instrumental. And a lot of people in Connecticut are speaking of him. They're mentioning his name as the potential Republican nominee in 1860. And of course, we know that that's what ends up happening. Well, during the interim, you know, once Lincoln is elected president in November, you know, the election occurs in November of 1860, he's announced president. Many of the southern states have promised that they will secede from the Union if a Republican is chosen as president. South Carolina is the beginning of that. They secede the earliest on December 20th. And then you have a series of other deep southern states that follow them immediately after uh, the election. Then you get the firing on Fort Sumter, April 12th, 1861. This is the real start of the war. There's a lot of people who think that the South is just bluffing. They think that, that South Carolina needs other states, that this is never going to really come to war, that the South has been threatening to leave the Union for decades, and that this is just all bluster. And when I was researching the book that I just finished, um, you could find all kinds of things uh, about the, I, the, the fact that many people in Connecticut just thought, oh, there go these Southerners again, they're not going to really do this. It's not until the firing on Fort Sumter that this all becomes a reality. And then that act also pushes some of the upper Southern states to join along in secession, the most important of which is Virginia. Virginia is very uncertain about going down this, this, this road of, of leaving the Union. Uh, in part because they know with where their geographical location is, 
they're going to be one of the major battlegrounds. And that, in fact, is exactly the case. Sixty percent of Civil War battles are fought in Virginia, and letter after letter from Connecticut soldiers speak of how torn up Virginia is. As they're marching through on their way to war, they say, oh my gosh, this looks like such a beautiful country at one time, but now even the bushes along the sides of the roads are demolished and destroyed and buildings are wrecked. And so Virginia has real questions about all of this. So here's a broadside that is held at the Museum of Connecticut History right down the road. This is, and you can see at the bottom, it says, nail this up. This is the call to arms for Connecticut citizens. Immediately after the war begins, uh, Connecticut, uh, Buckingham, you know, jumps into action, even without legislative approval. The legislature is not in session. He has to immediately get Connecticut regiments operating. He needs to get them equipped. He needs to get money put together to, to organize all of this and pay for the equipment. He actually uh, puts out promissory notes in the amount of $50,000 on his own credit in order to get Connecticut rolling. He then gets the Bank of Norwich to provide him with additional funds and then a number of other banks throughout Connecticut provide him with even more money until the legislature can come into session and allocate funds to cover all of this. Lincoln calls for 75,000 troops that's nothing compared to what ends up happening for this war. Millions of men are put into the service. 617,000 die during the Civil War. So when Lincoln first you know, calls forth these men to come to arms, everybody thinks that the war is going to be quick, and it's not. And of course, the beginning of the war goes extremely poorly for the Union. We lose Bull Run that everybody expects to be a complete southern route. We thought we were going to defeat them easily. And then most of the battles that follow go very, very poorly for the Union. And this leads, you know, Buckingham is re-elected in 61. He's re-elected in 62. But the Union is doing so poorly in this war that there's a lot of people who don't think we're going to be able to defeat the South. And all of this is playing into uh, the coming 1863 election. It also doesn't help that Lincoln, you know, we, we do finally win the Battle of Antietam in late 62, but, and, and it's directly after that that Abraham Lincoln announces his Emancipation Proclamation to release the slaves in rebelling states. But it's a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The real proclamation is going to come out January 1, 1863, Democrats in Connecticut, this is a time when you could flip-flop our political associations today and call the Democrats the conservatives and the Republicans the liberals to a large extent. And Democrats were absolutely outspoken in their opposition to abolition. They were, uh, you know, there were some pretty big racial issues within Connecticut. Uh, Democrats had been arguing, Thomas Seymour had argued that the Constitution protected the institution of slavery, that states had the right to secede, that the, the North had no right at all to try and, through the force of arms, maintain the Union and keep the South in. If they wanted to leave, they should be allowed to leave. And, and Seymour, Thomas Seymour, stuck by this kind of a message. And so once Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, there, the Democrats really play on that in preparation for this next April 1863 election. They, they, they utilize it and, and call, label all of the Republicans abolitionists and talk about the folly of the war, and they use it as much as they can to impact the Connecticut electorate. So, you know, as I said, the, the war is going disastrously. All of this is leading into the 1863 election. I, I write about it in the book as 1863 being the Union's crucible, that if they can survive 63... And, and win their political elections and win some military battles, they might actually be able to pull out this war. But up to the beginning of 1863, it's not looking real good. And a lot of eyes, again, are on Connecticut to, as this kind of bellwether for, is, is the Republican Party going to be able to survive? Thomas Seymour promises, absolutely promises, that if he is elected governor, Connecticut will no longer support the war. There will no longer be any troops going into the Union Army. There will no longer be any... He's going to try and shut down uh, any manufacturing that's going towards the war, any funding of the war. I and mean, this is serious, serious stuff. So you get 
uh, this is an appeal from the Republican State Central Committee that is published in the Hartford Current in mid-February, only a couple of months before the April election. And they state very plainly, a state election is soon to take place, more important than any which has occurred since the foundation of our government. Connecticut is to declare on the first Monday in April whether she is in favor of a dishonorable peace, submissions to the demands of armed traitors, and a dissolution of the Union, or whether she is determined at every hazard to defend the honor of our national flag and the Union of these states. You get the idea that they consider this election pretty serious. <clears throat> this is uh, the, the Northerner, Northern Democrats were often referred to as copperheads just like the snake, that they were slimy snakes that can't be trusted. And you can see the, the copperheads, and it's kind of that old Parsons of, of New England hat that they're wearing. And then you've got Lady, Lady Liberty defending herself with sword and shield uh, against the, these venomous copperheads who are attacking her. Well, one of the biggest components of the election of 1863 are soldiers' letters home. The, the Constitution of 1818, the Connecticut Constitution of 1818, does not allow anybody to vote from the field. You must be in the town that you reside in in order to vote. And so, ultimately, the, the General Assembly passes a law in 1864 bypassing this, but for this critical election in 63, soldiers can't vote unless they're furloughed to come home. And you can only furlough so many soldiers to get home. So letters home to the newspapers become absolutely instrumental. And it's actually the Hartford Times, which was a Democratic paper, and then the Hartford Current, which is our longest continuously published newspaper in the country. These are the two leading papers of the, of the state. The Current is Republican, the Times is Democratic, and they absolutely engage in an all-out newspaper battle. I've, I've argued that this letter campaign from soldiers is the single largest sustained marketing effort of the entire war, where they're really trying to influence the public in regard to what should happen with this war. And it starts with the Hartford Times. The letter is actually written in Janu on January 11th, but it's published on January 20th. And it states, the feeling here is that the Rebs can never be conquered by fighting. The soldiers are disheartened. And the Hartford Current later responds to this letter in what some of the soldiers say. February 9th, 1863. The feeling of the North, which we hear is growing more and more strong against the war, is doing an incalculable amount of injury in this army. And I hope it may soon give way to a feeling of sincere patriotism. Remember and do your duty in voting for Buckingham for governor. Another soldier offered... I was once in favor of compromise, conciliation, concession, but that was before the hellish act of firing on our country's flag had been consummated. consummated. But now I stand up unbroken and unbent, and my voice is for war, war, war. There are well over 40 letters that are shot back and forth throughout this campaign. Letter after letter after letter is sent forth. Some of them are quite remarkable. The 20th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry announces, We are amazed to find that in opposition to us, while here before the foe, and in hostility to the measures which have been adopted for the preservation of our liberties, there are at home men who attempt to conceal their sympathies with the rebellion by a cowardly clamor for peace. Other soldiers warned, when we have crushed the foe in front, we will ourselves, if necessity requires, take care of the more cowardly ones in the rear who are heaping contempt upon our cause and insult our efforts. Another soldier threatened, how would you and your loving wife or sister like a bloody war in Connecticut in consequence of a Seymour victory? So these soldiers are ready to turn, march back to Connecticut, and attack the home front if Seymour wins. Hartford Times ran similar types of letters. And of course, the lie unveiled. Uh, let's see. And then you get the broadsides that appear right before, these, right before the election. A vote for Buckingham. And they list out a variety of things that are going on. Uh, that, that what you will get if you vote for Buckingham. One of my favorite letters is by uh, a minister from 
Madison, Connecticut, a guy by the name of Sam Fisk, who writes under a pseudonym named Dunn Brown. And he is reading the Hartford Times and listening to what's going on, and he says, Give me a Hartford Times or some other appropriate receptacle, for I am nauseated, I am sick, poisoned, have taken something that most emphatically doesn't agree with me, have swallowed the vile and traitorous resolutions of the recent Democratic Convention at Hartford. He continued, if the dear old state doesn't spew out of her mouth this ill-savoring Tom Seymour democracy at the coming April election, we of the army will march north instead of south to get at the heart of the rebellion. Talk about demoralization of the army. So, these guys are not happy. <laughs> <laughs> with what's going on. And it, you know, it goes back and forth. The Hartford Times and the Hartford Current are, are publishing. It's almost a dueling batch of letters that are going back and forth. Ultimately, the victory goes to Buckingham. And you know, here you see a, a headline. You see, you know, this is the, the rooster announcing, you know, crowing the victory. And you get glorious news, the election, great union victory. And uh, the, the vote, it says Buckingham re-elected governor by from 2,000 to a 3,000 majority. The actual outcome is about 2,600 votes. Guess how many soldiers were furloughed to come home and vote? About 2,600. And so the Democrats charge political conspiracy. This is cheating. There, there may be some element of truth to this. Lincoln at some point had called forth... Thurlow Weed, the, the great political boss of New York, and said, we're having quite a tough time in Connecticut and New Hampshire. I can't provide any funds through legitimate avenues. Perhaps you can come up with some. And Weed pulls it off and actually funnels money to Connecticut. So is there a really smoking gun? That's about as smoking gun as we can get. But it's significant, and it gives you an idea of the level of partisanship and politics that is at play at this time. This is another one of the, the images that is published in the current, the last of the Copperheads. You have the great eagle killing the serpent. And then finally, once Buckingham wins this election, he realizes how important the election has been. And he delivers his May address to the General Assembly, and he says this. The conflict inaugurated at Sumter must go on until the government shall conquer or be conquered. Let no one be deceived by the artful device of securing peace by a cessation of hostilities or by yielding to the claims of our enemies. And he adds, slavery or abolitionism, by ambition or interference with states' rights, the fact that it, the war, exists as a verity forces upon us the duties of the hour. Okay. Thank you. to the panel to join us. Um, Mr. Droney and Mr. DeMore, if you'll come up. Professor Folko, come on up. Professor Warshower. When you were reading the quote uh, from the letter of, this, of the soldier who said he was nauseated by what happened at the Democratic Convention, I thought there were some people who went to both conventions <laughs> about a month ago who were a little nauseated at some of what they saw, so some things maybe don't change that much. Um, we wanted to, as we've been doing in this series of lectures, we want to bring you um, into the modern day and reflect on what happened here in this old state house and how it responds to what's happening um, in today's world and to show you the connection between the two. And so that's why we've brought our panel here today. And uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. Starting all the way over to my far left, we have uh, Mr. John Droney. Uh, John Droney is an attorney with Levy and Droney, and he specializes in litigation and government affairs. Now, John has a long history of advising political campaigns and politicians. He is the former chairman of the Connecticut Democratic Party, chairman of the Connecticut Clinton, uh, the Connecticut for Clinton campaign, the presidential campaign in 1992, as well as the national finance chairman for the Clinton campaign. He was a senior advisor to Senator Dodd when uh, Mr. Dodd was chair of the Democratic National Committee, and John was the co-chair of the Connecticut Clinton Gore campaign in 1996. He was an advisor to Senator Joe Lieberman during the Lieberman-Lamont campaign, and it should be Levy and Droney, I guess. Is that right, John? 
I don't care about Levy, just Droney. Make sure that. <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's Droney. Uh, sitting next to Mr. Droney is Tom Demore. Uh, Tom has more than 30 years of experience in local, state, and national government and politics. Uh, Tom is an expert in creating strategic communications, developing policy and tactics, and advising political <clears throat> campaigns. He's the chairman at Doyle, Demore, and Balducci, which is a public affairs consulting firm based in Hartford, Connecticut. Tom helps clients with full service campaign solutions from strategy development to execution. He is the former state Republican Party chairman, former chief of staff for the independent Connecticut governor, Lowell Weicker, and deputy commissioner of finance and personnel for Connecticut's governor, Tom Meskell. He was also a senior official on the U.S. Senate staff of Lowell Weicker and a resident fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and Mr. Demore was an advisor to Ned Lamont in his primary campaign against Senator Joseph Lieberman. Also joining us is Rennie Fulco, uh, Dr. Adrian Fulco, who is a professor at uh, Trinity University and who is a well-known uh, commentator on political events. She uh, specializes in political history and the uh, intersection between politics and public policy. And if her name sounds familiar to you, it's probably because she is a regular guest on many uh, national and local television and radio programs, including with Colin McEnroe uh, frequently and with Ray Dunaway. So thank you all for being here. And I'm going to start with a quote from the New Haven Register and what they said about that election in the state of Connecticut in 1860. And the quote was, a nation is waiting in almost breathless suspense to hear the results. Well, it was interesting because recently um, in researching for this event, I was reading an Associated Press article from August 9th, 2006, which of course was the day after the Democratic uh, primary in Connecticut. And that quote said, three-term Senator Joe Lieberman fell to anti-war challenger Ned Lamont in Connecticut's Democratic primary Tuesday, a race seen as a harbinger of sentiment over the conflict in Iraq that has claimed the lives of more than 2,500 U.S. troops. So the parallels between how the nation perceived these two races seem pretty clear. Uh, was it really the truth? Well, Let's ask our panelists. John Droney, I'll start with you. Was that really a, a national referendum? Uh, uh, on the war itself? Um, sort of. All right. And uh, actually, that's a lawyer's answer, but it's an accurate answer. It was the way that Lamont uh, won the primary. Uh, it was the way that Lamont lost the general election. Uh, it was the first of many campaigns and, uh, where extremists on the left in the Democratic Party or extremists on the right in the Republican Party uh, played what we call litmus test politics. Uh, regardless of the record of the man or the woman who served as an incumbent on either side, if they didn't meet certain ideological tests, then the better organized extremists in both parties, and on our, my party it's on the left and on Tom's it's on the right, uh, decided they would sanitize the party or purify the party and drive that person out so that that person who would run representing the Democrats or the Republicans in the future would be ideologically pure. I mean, I don't know why the Lord speaks directly to these people on either side, but that's what, what I saw when I was there. How about you, Mr. DeMoore? Um, I'm sorry to say I can't disagree with very much of what uh, John said. The only exception I'll take to that is that it, it, I don't think that Lamont, in this case, uh, lost the election uh, because of his position on the war. And at the same time, um, I think it was clearly the reason that he won the primary. There, there were many other reasons uh, that mostly had to do with internal politics uh, as opposed to uh, what his position on the war was. And, and taking that a step further, um, I was beginning to feel slightly schizophrenic as uh, I was listening to the descriptions of the various uh, parties and when they stood during that war. And um, I... I've had my differences a long time ago with John Droney, but I never once thought of him as a copperhead. It's a much nicer idea. <laughs> Believe me, I've been called a lot worse. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> but, but I would correct the record so that uh, Tom would understand what I said. Sometimes people on the right uh, in the Republican Party have difficulty with the English language, even though they claim that it should be the only language in America. Uh, I, I believe that Lamont lost the election, the general election, because he refought the primary, you see. 
there was more to the election than just Iraq in the general election. It was the deciding factor in the primary. But when he refought the same battle all over again from a, uh, a, an expense and a concentration on media, he lost sight of the fact that most of the people in the center uh, from both parties and the independents wanted to hear more about other issues and were concerned about other things. Yeah, t time and again it's, it's been proven that we really govern from the center. Uh, neither party seems to have learned a lesson that, you know, you, you can't go from the either the extreme left or extreme right. That's just not who we are, particularly in a state like Connecticut. Professor Folko, I see that you're anxious to get in on this. That, that's fine. Um, interesting comments all around. Um, I was thinking that, that one of the questions that occurs to me, you know, both when we go back historically and when we look at more recent events, is to what extent uh, are local politics representative of national trends? And I think that's a really interesting question. And I would say in 2006, my reading of that campaign was that the, the election here was representative of national trends. In other words, I think the issue of the war was extremely important, and I think it set the tone in some of the other races that followed. But what I also think of uh, when I look back on uh, 2006 and the period since is really the increased polarization in terms of American politics all around. And I know that that's a general theme of this series. So if there's an opportunity, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. And I think, again, there are very interesting parallels between these two periods. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Warshower, one of the things that um, you talked about very eloquently, you showed examples of those letters that were written allegedly by soldiers. I mean, I suppose we can't necessarily That's always the big question, that. and I, I, I yeah. questioned that myself. Yeah, letters that seem to support one side or the other, depending on which paper was publishing them. And I wonder how much you see that reflected today. And I think about things like um, both parties saying, uh, if you don't support the troops, you know, you should support the troops in wartime, regardless. You have to support the troops, and a nation supports its president. And people said, well, I can be against the war in Iraq, but I'm still supporting my nation and I'm supporting my troops. I just disagree with what we're doing right now. That's a really complicated question. Uh, I had, uh, I, I taught a class on political history about a year ago, and the class happened to fall on September 11th. And it, it, we, we discussed that exact issue, and I had a couple of kids in the class who, I say kids, but a couple of young men in the class who had served a couple of tours of duty in Iraq. And their position was firmly, you cannot be for the troops and against the mission. And it really created a sense of debate within the class. And, you know, I think one of the things that's really changed in an example of when we do learn from history is from the experiences that follow Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Because that was a time when we blamed the soldiers for the actual mission as opposed to, you know, those who decided to go to war. And I, I, I think a lot of Americans do understand the difference. In the Civil War period, uh, you know, you've got 47 percent of men from between the ages of 15 and 50 from Connecticut who go to war. Everybody else, is, everybody who stays home, is in some capacity engaged in the war. And I, you know, one of the problems we have today is that we're fighting a war in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq, and many, many people at home aren't affected by it in the least. It doesn't impact our daily lives. You can't say that about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk to uh, John Droney again and to Tom Damore. Um, when uh, Ned Lamont pulled off that victory in the primary, let me ask you, and I'll start with you, John, what was the reaction, Democrats and Republicans? What was the inside reaction? Well, you know, obviously, you know, in a, in a modern campaign, we had been polling. I wasn't that involved in the primary campaign. I had a sort of a I, had a, I got a little snarky and had a little snit with some of the people who were running it in May and thought that we should have attacked uh, Mr. Lamont a little bit more and stop playing softball with him. Uh, but um, when it was apparent from looking at the polls that we were 10 points out and then we closed to about four points, uh, it was clear to us that we were going to lose the primary. So instead of uh, sulking in our tents, uh, we concocted a commercial that Joe went on the next day 
indicating he was going to run as an independent, and those were the reasons why. And Mr. Lamont accommodated us by taking a long vacation, I think, to Nantucket or some other place where the people from Greenwich go, and uh, conceded the field to us for two weeks. And by that time, the party was almost over. Mr. Jamore? Um, as, to, <laughs> uh, as to the, uh, the business of, of the ad, I, I want to the first commercial. And, uh, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm unrepentant about that. I understand. I understand. Always have been. I expect always will be. Uh, I, there's, there really is a disconnect, and I don't want to leave uh, this unsaid. If, if a general election is really a reflection of where the state is going, then clearly this state, talk about schizophrenic, this state was solidly in favor of the war because uh, Senator Lieberman won a, a resounding victory. It wasn't close. It was 10 points. Yeah, 10 points. So that, that's a big deal, 50 mm -hmm. to, uh, to 40. So on the one hand, you had the disconnect that, uh, a segment of the population felt largely, you know, centered in the Democratic Party. That's those are the folks who vote in those primaries. Was solidly against um, the war, and then, and then on the other hand, uh, Senator Lieberman uh, was for. Interestingly enough, what I remember, and I guess there's a tendency as in politics as in life, is sort of remember the things you'd like to remember. The, the, the first ad I recall, which I thought was uh, devastating to Mr. Uh, Lamont. Uh, aside from being away on vacation, uh, was that the early ads went very quickly to uh, Joe Lieberman standing there uh, indicating that, that no one, absolutely no one, there was an ad saying that was more anxious to get the troops out of Iraq and end the war, which was a bit contradictory to say the least in terms of his voting record, but very, very effective. Well, we, we follow the rule of Oscar Wilde that a fatal consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Often works in <laughs> politics. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Rennie? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I might look at this a little bit differently um, in that it seems to me that that primary did express a discontent about the war that I think was national. However, you have to look very specifically at the local politics of Connecticut. And this is, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about. Again, to what extent can we nationalize mm -hmm. questions or understand the issues from a national perspective or is it better to look locally? And it seems to me when you look at no. that race, uh, Lieberman was an extremely popular senator. He had lots and lots of support and I think it would have been difficult under almost any circumstances to really beat Lieberman. Um, and, and so I, I, again, what I would emphasize is that um, you know, in many ways, too, Lieberman, I think, is viewed as a fairly moderate mm -hmm. Democrat. And so what you really had in that election, it seems to me, was, you know, the, the Lieberman, the moderate, who clearly won in Connecticut, but you also had Lamont, who represented something very, very different. And, and, and again, I think that if we uh, can untangle this a little bit, we can see uh, more about the nature of polarization in, in the whole political process. Well, and it's um, interesting, John, you and I talked before this, and we talked about polarization, and you started your comments today with this polarization within the party, and um, you talked about how this was the beginning of uh, the party being really influenced, the Democratic Party really being influenced by what were, used to be referred to, maybe still are, as the net roots, the people like Daley Koss and, and those organizers. Um, and, and I came across a, a, an article that said, and this was a Lamont volunteer who had come to Connecticut from Boston to work on the campaign who said in a story right after the primary, people are going to look back and say the Bush years started to end in Connecticut. Is that really what it was about or was it really about part, somehow part of, part of their campaign, the uh, which had a national flair to it, uh, was uh, led by the Daily Koss, uh, uh, an extremely, uh, we call it plain, deep left field blogger uh, who has a lot of influence and had a, um, I remember, uh, a, a convention every year where all of the political consultants in the Democratic side who wanted to work in Democratic politics went there and paid homage to this clown. Uh, and uh, we were very close, uh, he and I, Michael Koss is his name. <laughs> and uh, they, um, they were, the consultants we had in the primary when I had the little snit were afraid to attack him. He appeared in a Lamont ad, okay? He was sitting next to Lamont. Uh, grinning on the couch, one of the early ads. Now this is the same clown who, uh, when four uh, former um, 
United States Army um, Special Forces guys who were working as contractors were killed in Iraq and their bodies were burned and they were strung up on a bridge. I don't know if you remember that in 2004, made some derogatory comments about that. Well, we wanted to raise that issue as to who Lamont was associating with and what was really going on in Little Connecticut and the consultants talked uh, the early uh, uh, Lieberman people out of doing that and we ended up just pretending that he was just an interested blogger. But he has a na had a national agenda. Uh, one of their most effective primary ads was what was the kiss, was it? Where Bush kissed uh, Lieberman or Lieberman kissed Bush and I've told Lieberman not to be so affectionate anymore. <laughs> it, was very uh, it was a very touching moment. Um, <laughs> Right, and uh, the they, then they would morph Lieberman's face into Bush's, you know, which it, so it did have national and local effects. And it, it is an interesting attempt by the left in our party mm -hmm. to take over. And we actually we've, we have a party now that really is what we call a donut party, has no center. Interesting. Um, Tom, you had been, to my mind, a lifelong Republican. Then you, um, Low Wiker, became an independent, and you kind of went along the independent path with Low Wiker. So the idea of Lamont coming to you to see how to run an independent campaign, I thought was an interesting juxtaposition of where you'd been in the past as a Republican, where you'd been with Low Wiker, and where this liberal Democrat was going to go. Well, first of all, I appreciate you bringing that up because I... I'm, uh, by way of disclaimer, I have not been a Republican since, although I, I would have enjoyed being a Republican back in the day, historically, uh, but have not been active as a Republican since 1990. That, that is uh, mm -hmm. correct. But, but to back up to something, um, and, and now to have indicated my somewhat neutrality, um, I'll say publicly that one of the things, happily, that, that still is valued in, in public life and politics these days is service. And, to the point you made about politics being local. Uh, Joe Lieberman was viewed, and rightly so, as a very positive force and a dedicated public servant. He'd served as uh, Attorney General and I think served the state very well in, in Washington. So I think there was a, a good bit of that in the general election, and, and I, I think it's a positive. I didn't like the outcome very much, but it certainly is a positive uh, trend that at least you know voters are paying attention to something other than some white hot burning issue uh, of the moment and that you know that speaks that speaks well of, of the future particularly uh, when you look at what's going on today they were the uh, what was the group that uh, was started here in Connecticut the wide awakes yeah, yeah. That, that you know I hope it's not the latest and John and I were talking about earlier um, is the uh, the Tea Party I mean I I don't see a connection there hopefully that uh, there's no connection. I would guess that that's probably going to be the new right of the Republican Party, the way things are <laughs> you, going. You're hoping it will be. Yes, I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Professor, do you see a connection there? Well, I mean, I, I don't know enough about the history, to be honest, of the period. You probably have a much better sense. But certainly, there is historically, there have been moments when groups like this have come forward mm -hmm. and often, you know, very angry, very it's, upset. Well, it's usually when the people feel like government and politicians are not responding to the needs of the people and they feel that liberty in particular is being endangered, whatever their definition of liberty is, that's when these groups come forward the most and the Civil War period was very common and, and as you had said earlier, I see a lot of parallels between what happened in terms of party structure and partisanship just before the start of the Civil War and today, not that we're going to end up having a civil war. <laughs> yeah, and I would say that this has been building. I mean, my view of this is we've been moving in a much more polarized direction over time. As I was preparing for the talk today, I did some reading, and it's pretty amazing to see, not that there haven't been other periods of polarization, but that this is certainly one where you just have virtually no middle ground. And again, I think um, whatever one thinks of Lieberman, Historically, he has been somebody who's willing to cross party lines. In other words, he's somebody who's really been able to get along with members of, of the other party. And increasingly, those people are disappearing <clears throat> from the national political scene. And I think that's disturbing. Well, there, there is one uh, little ray of hope, perhaps, and that was Lincoln's uh, election, not the Lincoln you were talking about, but the one in Arkansas recently, uh, where Blanche she is a moderate, yeah. uh, and she was attacked by MoveOn.org and every labor union in the country, and she basically said to our Kansans, you know, hey, 
this home cooking right here, you know, what are yeah. these outsiders trying to do? And they put her back in. Now, she faces a substantial Republican opponent in the general election, but it was the first time that a local argument like you're talking about had overridden the attempt by our left to punish somebody who had acted as a moderate during some of the votes. Hey, can, I, can I ask a quick question, Dan? I'm curious. I don't know the answer to this, and I'm curious to know to what extent in Lieberman, uh, in that, that election between Lieberman and Lamont, to what extent did the Republican candidate impact the voting? Without Alan Gold and his activities at Foxwoods, we couldn't have won. Yeah. Uh, uh, in order Mr. to as well have been chairman of uh, see of and, and there you go with another so. very direct historical parallel because when Lincoln ran in 1860, he couldn't have won without that split in the Democratic Party yeah. where you've got Breckenridge for the Southerners and Douglas for the Northerners and you know whenever you get a, a third third party or third party esque type of a candidate and you split your main party, that's, that's the end for you. Uh, you're, I guess you're the, dark, the dark side of what you're talking about is inside baseball with what happens, you know, in terms of, of the party apparatus. He, yeah. he effectively was, he, Lieberman, was effectively uh, the default Republican nominee in that race. Right. Uh, and you could you make the same, it may come as a shock to John, you can make the same argument about Weicker when he was elected governor was in, in, in many ways sort of the default mm -hmm. uh, Democrat nominee. In, in it, and again, it speaks well of, of uh, of, of the voter, you know, when they get fed up, they're willing to do dramatic things, yeah. since parties don't, at the time, don't represent their views, is to reach out and do something, and it's somewhat radical to elect an independent, yeah. right, set so. aside both parties. We only have about five minutes left, because we like to tell people that they can get in and get out at their lunch hour, but I'd like to have each of you make one last statement. I can see that you Sure. Yeah, just yeah. one thing that I think I, I would like to make sure uh, we just mention. Um, you know, some people might be asking, you know, why didn't the Democrats just tell Lieberman to take a hike, right? This question has been asked. In other words, why, if somebody seems to be moving, you know, in, in a different direction, wouldn't you, uh, you know, simply relieve him of his chairmanships, for example? And I think um, a point that we should just uh, keep in mind, if, if the theme here also is the importance of Connecticut, is the importance of that vote. And it's been clear, uh, certainly since Obama has been elected, and even before, that Joe Lieberman's vote is extremely important. And I would just mention to people today, uh, you know, given what's going on, the crisis in the Gulf, that Lieberman and Senator Kerry are co-sponsoring a very important energy bill. Uh, they had, a, 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 I believe, a press conference this morning. It was supposed to be this morning. And so I would just have people keep their eye on that ball, too, because it, it really matters. Again, when you talk about why Connecticut matters, there are lots of reasons. Matt? I would argue to the people who are here and those who, who watch us at home something that I tell my students all the time, and that is that your vote and your participation and your following of what's going on in your, you know, your town, in your state, in your uh, you know, national government, it matters. When you're talking about 541 votes for Buckingham, you're talking about the 2000 election, which is a spread of a few thousand votes. Uh, our, our uh, involvement in this thing we call democracy matters. And if you don't take your citizenship seriously, you're going to get things you don't necessarily like. Can we excerpt that as a commercial for CTN? Because that's our mission. <laughs> that's terrific. <laughs> Tom? No, uh, that, that's terrific. That's a wonderful uh, statement. And for running out of time, that's as positive a note as I can imagine uh, that, that we could end on. It does matter. Yeah. Participation matters. John? Well, to, to not be uh, echoing what Tom says, um, I was a practicing politician for many years, and I can respond to uh, Professor Falco's question, and that is if Harry Reid had 65 votes in the Senate, they would have dumped Joe and right. thrown him under the bus. Yeah, that's right. But just as soon as it became 59 or 60, make any difference. You're talking about winners and who's going to control the, the play in the most deliberative body in the world. Well, I thank you all for joining us, John Droney, Tom Damore, Matt Warshauer, and Rennie Folko. And we thank you for joining us at home, and we thank you for joining us here at the Old State House for our summertime lecture series. We hope that you'll uh, come to our next one, too. Thank you.